So uh, welcome to the paper four lectures, which are designed to give you a survey of the development of Middle High German and the changes from Middle High German to modern German. And I've structured it in a way that um, we are taking the topics that are also the tutorial topics for the uh, historical linguistics paper. Um, all of those that are kind of pre-modern and go through it with application to a specific text. And that text is a text that is very dear to my heart. Um, four volumes of that uh, formed the core of my uh, doctoral dissertation. And I came across um, the text because it was written in Bamberg around 1300, and that's where I did my undergraduate. Um, exam. So I, I know most of the places where Hugo von Trimberg uh, lived and it was really a bestseller of the Middle Ages and has been one of the unjustly forgotten texts. But a more particular reason why choosing it as, as an example for the historical linguistic lectures is that it uh, provides a kind of extended Helmbrecht. And you know, um, Helmbrecht is the set text for paper four, but it has quite a limited amount of text. And uh, the Renner with his uh, 23,000 um, uh, verses can help us understand some of uh, the background of the Helmbrecht text. For example, it deals with a phenomenon of Halbritter, those who are neither properly knights nor peasants. So the main problem that uh, Helmbrecht uh, faces. And it also, Hugo von Trimberg, he's a schoolmaster. So uh, he includes reflections on the nature of language. Um, uh, these are passages we are looking at more closely when we are looking, um, for example, at dialects, because that is something that Hugo himself reflects upon. So the eight um, weeks will be starting with a topic, which is also the topic for the first essay, how does German change between 1170 and today? And for that, we'll compare the normalized, standardized Middle High German of the edition that um, Eresmann did of the Renner, with a text that is actually transmitted in the um, manuscript uh, themselves. So um, you see here on the left hand side the figure of the Renner as author image for Hugo von Trimberg from a manuscript that is uh, in Switzerland in the uh, library that Bootmer built up and that was written around 14 68. So if you remember, the general dating for Middle High German is that it takes um, a, about until 1350. And so this is written in an early New High German text. So we can compare the text of the manuscript and the standardized Middle High uh, German text to see what has actually changed between the time of Hugo von Trimberg and then uh, the emergence of early New High German. Um, we'll then look more closely to define Middle High German, uh, look at the changes of verbs in the third session, look at periphrastic verb forms. Uh, in week five, we'll take a pause in the actual lecture series to participate in a fascinating workshop that is organized by Luise Morawetz, whom uh, you will have met as lecturer for the previous series of lectures. And that um, has an invitation to international historical linguists. And um, they are speaking about the Mobach hymns, which are 
uh, Old High German glosses in a Latin manuscript. So this will fit perfectly in the topic for week five language contact. Then we are looking at pronouns of address, starting from how Hugo von Trimberg addresses the peasants uh, differently from nobility. We look at um, language and gender in week seven, and you might guess it's not a very rosy picture with regard to um, how Hugo von Trimberg deals with uh, girls and women. And finally, uh, dialects uh, looking at how Bamberg with a Franconian dialect fits into the wider picture of German. But I, I thought it would be best to start by just reading you um, the reflection by Hugo, how he comes about to um, actually write, which um, is quite, I think, witty, but uh, which hasn't been recognized as making fun actually of poetry. Um, I've given you on the right hand side some glosses for uh, texts that you might not recognize immediately. So verlaubet, for example, is the opposite of erlauben. So uh, tichtens verlauben, because erlauben is, uh, and verlauben are constructed with genitive, is to stop somebody from tichten, from poetry. So um, tichtens verlaubet means um, uh, I had stopped uh, or I had forbidden myself to do poetry. Tichtens, hätte ich mich verlaubet, von der Zieht her, sieht min haubet manniger Laie Döne gewann. Siehe denn, dir sind, süßen, singen, zitschern, grellen, snurren, klingen. Dir Döne ich gelernet han, dir mir vorgau unkund waren, bis ich kam gehen 50 Jahren. Do huab sich ihr Ambet an, das mir täglich erzeiget, wie sich gehen dem Tode neiget in Alter zieht, Wieb und Mann. Allein mir nur die Uhren dir sind und die Augen überfliersen, doch will ich ein Bürche lien, minen Gurten frühenden Tichten und mit Riemen so berichten, dass sie da bi gedenken mi. What I wanted to show you with reading out this bit um, is how much more um, poetic Middle High German can be because it has a wider range of sounds. Um, so the development from Middle High German to early New High German means mainly a weakening of unstressed syllables and um, a reduction of the repertoire of vowels. Uh, here you still have all this um, repertoire of vowels to show the different forms of Döne. Döne, Töne means both um, the sounds, so here he um, speaks effectively about tinnitus that he has got since uh, he has turned 50, like me, um, and all the unfortunate noises that his head now produces. But he uh, does it in the vocabulary that's also used for Minnesang or Meistergesang. So uh, the Meistersinger have their different Döne in which they write their uh, poetry. So his hat has uh, developed a poetry of its own by producing this Sie den Bier sind süßen, singen, zwitschern, grellen, snurren, klingen. So kind of onomatopoetic uh, verbs for producing sound, not all of them in a pleasant way. So um, he first starts, typical for a poet, with a Absage an die Dichtung. So I actually decided never to do poetry again. And why did he uh, change his view? Um, so to uh, create memoria for himself. So the last line, which I have on this slide, 
dass sie dabei gedenken ihn. An this uh, word gedenken, um, to keep in good memory, is a key term for understanding uh, medieval culture, because it, it means you do everything for um, post uh, um, death fame, for posthumous um, fame. And so he writes this Bürcherlin, this little book booklet um, to uh, encourage his friends to think of him. And uh, he specifies more closely how they should think of him. Svelche es lesen oder hören lesen, dir sollen meiner Seele wesen gnädig, gnädig, uh, merciful. Wenn ihr geschrieben start, zwer für eins andern Schulde bitte, sin selbes Seele löse er da Mitte und tillige auch sin Missetat. So producing poetry um, is his way of um, providing goods for his friends in exchange for intercession on his behalf. And then he has a preview of his, um, what he has been producing before he stopped um, writing poetry because of his um, age-old ailments. For um, hätte ich sieben Bürcherlin in Tütsch gemacht und in Latin fünftes Halbes, das ist wahr. Das Halbe will ich lassen belieben und will das zum Ersten schreiben. So, he now wants to write this particular book as first uh, one. Gottes Gürte mich bewahr an Worten, an Werken und an Sinne, dass ich sie also beginne und auch vollbringe in seinem Namen, dass es ihm genehme sie und dass wir werden leidesfrei. Sprechet alle mit mir. Amen. So that's quite a good um, start also for a, a lecture uh, to ask everybody to help um, pray for the lecturer to um, get through the whole thing without uh, hiccups or uh, mishap. Um, and you see him in this uh, uh, image riding, holding up uh, the book of poetry which he has done. Uh, so this whole section until uh, line 36 is the so-called prologus praeterem, so outside the actual matter of uh, the book, just justifying why uh, the production is done. To give you just a very quick outline, um, Hugo von Trimberg is one of the authors we know more about than uh, for most of the authors you will have had contact with. So um, while Hartmann von Aue, um, Wolfram von Eschenbach, Walter von der Vogelweide are really very hazy figures, uh, here with the schoolmaster, uh, slightly later than uh, this uh, poets around 1200, uh, he, he was writing uh, around 1300, this uh, Renner. We get much more information partly because he tells us about it in his poem. So a didactic poem always invites reflection on your own life and how it relates to uh, the subject matter. And um, partly uh, because he lived in a town, um, in a cathedral town uh, that had a very good record holding. So we have the records of the um, Stift St. Gangolf in Bamberg, in the suburb of Teuerstadt. And so we can reconstruct much more of his life than for most of uh, the classical um, authors of the Middle High German um, period. He was, um, had only the lower um, ranks of clerical order because he was a married cleric, so he um, constantly complains that the clergy in Bamberg is living a much uh, more wealthy life than he uh, who has to supply for uh, a range of uh, children and his 
wife. But it's also interesting because he is between uh, the uh, what's called the uh, Domberg, so the cathedral power in Bamberg, and the civic community, which is uh, down at the riverside of the uh, river uh, Regnitz. And he draws on both spheres. So he draws on the Latin learning, uh, which he had studied and which he is passing on to his uh, pupils in the uh, school. And But he's also drawing on vernacular stories and entertainment that he uh, has access to not being part of an enclosed monastic community, but rather living his life outside. And uh, actually, he started off with a personal note and he ends the whole uh, uh, poem, Der Renner, with a personal note, saying, Der das Buch getichtet hat, der Pflack der Skur zur Türstadt, wohl 40 Jahre vor Babenberg, und hier ist Hug von Trimperg. Es ward dichtet, das ist wahr, du tusend und drühhundert Jahr von Christus Geburt vergangen waren. And I've given you another uh, illuminated manuscript of Der Renner on the right hand side, where you see uh, the figure of a clearly distressed looking schoolmaster uh, with a, a lecturer's cap on his, uh, it's like the soft cap uh, you wear also um, for matriculation uh, uh, and a gown um, uh, with an open mouth and kind of shouting out this epilogue um, and having a, a scroll under him, O Welt wie ungetreu, so complaining about this. And this a manuscript, which was written in the first third of the 15th century in Swabia, um, turns these lines into der dies Buch gedichtet hat, so Buch instead of Buch, uh, gedichtet instead of gedichtet, der Pflag der Schule zu Teuerstadt, so instead of school, Türstadt, Schule, Teuerstadt, so you have both monophonization and diphthongization um, applied to the text. Wohl 40 Jahre, so 40 instead of 40, uh, for Bamberg und hieß or hears. So we don't know whether it would have been spoken as a monophong, um, as in the modern spelling of um, I-E-S-Z, uh, so whether the E in hieß is already a denungs E or whether it's still, as in Middle High German, a diphthong hieß. Uh, but the comparison with uh, Filzig, which doesn't have a denungs E, um, sh shows that probably the scribe of the Augsburg manuscript would have um, used monophongs for the Middle High German diphthongs. And, um, Hug von Trimberg. So um, just to give you a rough overview of where Bamberg is located, it's um, nowadays in the northeast corner of uh, Bavaria. Um, um, it's the furthest north of the high German dialect. So um, German can be roughly split into these three areas of Low German and then the Benrata Linie, um, having a south of which you have the second consonant, um, the, uh, the vowel uh, shift applied, but also the second consonant uh, shift. So um, there you have Central German uh, with a Thuringian a dialect and Saxon. And then further south, um, along the Main, um, you have High German, which then reaches down south. 
And um, East Franconian, the dialect in which uh, Hugo von Trimberg is writing, um, is closest to what in the 19th century was declared to be the type of höfische Dichtersprache of standardized Middle High German. So it, it's a good um, example to take. Um, just a brief word also why it's called Der Renner. Um, it's uh, partly in the modern German sense of uh, Ein Renner is a bestseller. And um, this is the sense in which Michael de Leone, who was a law clerk in Würzburg, um, recorded this. Um, he uh, did um, in the early uh, 14th century a full a transcription of Der Renner and in the table of contents he writes Zu dem ersten steht die Vorräte des Buches Renner genannt, wenn es soll rennen durch die Land. So he calls it uh, Renner because he thinks it should spread, the word should spread about this poem across uh, the German lands. Uh, Middle High German texts never come with a title of their own. Um, if you don't have uh, a clerk like Michael de Luone giving it a title. Uh, but it's quite an appropriate metaphor to use because it's also a term, Rennen, that Hugo von Trimberg uses several times whenever he has got tired of a specific topic, he says, let's uh, move on from here. And he uses for this moving on the word uh, rennen. So, for example, at the end of a section on vanity, he writes, Nu soll wir aber für was rennen und unseren Herren was erkennen. Now we should uh, move on, run on and um, recognize our Lord, um, so uh, God, uh, better, so to get further insight. Uh, or in a, a, in a longer uh, section, when he st stops talking about uh, the sin of being too um, gluttonous, he uh, and has been speculating about spiritual meanings of that, he says, Diesen tiefen Sinn soll wir nicht trennen und sollen, aber für was rennen auf weltlicher Tourenstraßen. Um, uh, then uh, he has a kind of disclaimer that he doesn't want to go too deeply into spiritual matters because that's a, something for properly qualified priests and not for him as a schoolmeister. Zwei tiefer Rede sich nicht will maßen. So somebody who can't uh, put a measurement or a stop uh, be measure, measured in talking about Tierverrede, deep meaning, und dir nicht wohl bewähren kann, but hasn't means to prove uh, the, that it's right. Bewähren means beweisen. Der mag wohl sehen, ein Tummermann uh, could be called uh, quite a stupid person. And the uh, metaphor of uh, the Renner is also picked up by most illustrators of um, this poem. So you have a uh, title image, somebody uh, galloping across uh, Germany, spreading the text. So if we compare here Middle High German to early New High uh, German for the section we've just been uh, looking in at. So uh, the normalized Middle High German reads, uh, Doch will ich ein Bürchelin meinen guten Freunden tichten. Um, I've marked in red the Middle High German monophongs, I, Büchelin, Ü, Fründen, the third one, 
we don't have an example for that in this passage would be long u, like oof. Um, uh, and that um, is shifted in the diphthongization to ai, oi, and au. So, um, Büchelin becomes Büchelein in the Bavarian caption of uh, the manuscript around 1460 or written in 1468, and mean becomes mine. And in the text below the uh, image of the rider, you have an instruction for the illustrator saying, da soll einer auf einem Ross sitzen und ein Puch in der Hand haben und ein Reim über ihn aufgehen, doch will ich dichten ein Büchelein meinen Freunden, dass sie nicht vergessen meinen. So you can check up whether the illustrator has fully understood um, what uh, they were supposed to do. And I think uh, they got it uh, quite well in um, capturing this person sitting on a horse with a book in um, his hand and dem Reim, so the scroll with a uh, rhymed text, um, aufgehen über ihn, so uh, extended like a tent above um, the rider. And there you also see this shift from u, uf, einem Ross, it would be in Middle High German, so auf einem Ross. Um, you can also see that uh, these three shifts of New High German diphthongization, New High German monophthongization, and lowering lowering of diphthongs, ö, au, ai, don't um, happen simultaneously in the different dialects, because the Bavarian dialect clearly has full diphthongization at that point. But until today, Bavarian still has um, these Middle High German diphthongs, ur, uh, ihr, um, and ur. So if you speak to a Bavarian um, from up in the Alps who speaks a strong dialect, they'll still say Böcherlin or Böcherlein. They'll have the ein, but not the ur. So these uh, three uh, vowel changes um, move in a different way. So the uh, diphthongization uh, starts in Bavaria and moves north. So we have a full set of uh, diphthongs, mein neues Haus in the 15th century in Bavaria, while the monophthongization moves from north to south. Uh, so it starts in central German, um, where Lieber Süßer Bruder already around 1350 is completely changed to Lieber Süßer Bruder, but it doesn't quite arrive at the south end of the high German area. And uh, the lowering opening of diphthongs is um, also moving from the north. So it's difficult to determine how much had arrived with this uh, in this manuscript because um, you see here in the caption einer einem ein Reim. Um, so um, they um, should be all lowered vowels, but we can't tell apart because the spelling is completely interchangeable between Middle High German and New High German. So we can't say if it's spelled A-I, um, it's uh, lowered, and if it's spelled E-I, it's still ein and not ein, because um, the scribe isn't consistent in their spelling. So you have the same word spelled with A, uh, I, or E, I, or even E, Y, if you, uh, if you see further back in the line, ein Reim, wir ihn aufgehen. 
Um, I had said I would uh, do just half an hour of lecturing, but uh, I've been a bit slow in getting started, so I'll continue for another 10 minutes uh, lecturing before I stop the uh, recording to give you an impression of the prologus ante rem. So um, the second prologue, which actually deals with the subject matter at hand and the subject matter of der Renner is all the vices of the world or the follies of the world and what to do not to fall into the traps of being foolish. While um, Hugo van Trimberg quite enjoys telling actually the foolish uh, stories. Um, I'll read uh, through it occasionally um, commenting. I've highlighted uh, in colors here the vowel changes um, that uh, and you can try to figure out what they would be in um, early New High German. Actually, you can, if you want, compare with a, a manuscript on the right hand side because that's again taken from the Swiss manuscript in the uh, Bibliothek Bodmeyana. And so it has for the first line, ich kam auf ein Heide. So again, you have the differentiation of long u to au. And it's uh, the typical uh, opening, which you also have in English lit literature, like Pilgrim's Progress, of somebody going for a stroll, coming to see something remarkable, and then trying to figure out what is the uh, meaning of this remarkable um, occurrence. Ich kam auf eine Heide, du zu guter Augen weide, harte Wolge ziert was. Do drungen Blumen durch das Gras, von Blumen was sie Pfeller fahr. Ein Stieg, der mich brachte da, der was grasig und es mal. Die Heide lag in einem Tal, gliche gemessen und nicht zu breit, mit hohen Bergen ümmeleit. Da inne begonn ich ümmegehen. Do sach ich einen Baum dort stehen, uf einem grünen Reine, gesundert alters eine, der was gezieret harte woll, wenn er es durnt lichter blürte voll. Unter dem Baume einhalb was ein harte wunnekliches Gras. Da bies durnt ein wilder Dorn, der hätt ihm da ein Stadt erkorn. And quite conveniently, uh, the manuscripts uh, illustrate exactly what the narrator sees of this lovely Augenweide, so where he can feast his eyes uh, upon. Uh, literally, I meadow, Augenweide, it's a word still used in, in modern German. So there is the pear tree in the middle and he watches as um, the uh, scene actually changes because the pears start dropping. So be dem uh, pear tree, be dem stuant ein Lache, wisset, das meinet Sache, wenn er da be stuant ein Brunne. Da war's Michel Wunne. Auf dem Baume sungen die Vogelin. Was möchte Wunne Kliecher sehen? So der Baum, den ich sah, auf der Heide, als ich es brach, siner blürte, ward Ahne, geladen ward er Sahne mit manniger Birn, das ist wahr. Eh denne dir zietig würden gar, ein Teil ward ihr gebrochen abe. Dir lasse wir belieben, zwer dir habe. Zwem der Suren einü ward, der den Gerau filierte, du fahrt. So this is one of his uh, funny asides. Uh, so um, he is commiserating with somebody who is picking one of uh, those pears that have fallen um, before they were actually ripe and who will regret uh, taking a bite into one of this sour pears. Der andern Birn was dennoch genug. Es wir viel das Wetter, so Unwetter in that sense, um, a storm, an sie slurk, doch wollten sie nicht falle, bis dass sie zietig alle miteinander wurden gar. Du kam ein Wind geflogen da, der ist Vierwitz genannt. Vierwitz uh, spelled here by the editor with a capital, 
um, because initial because it's a personification of one of um, the sins. Fürwitz uh, is something that uh, is um, uh, always wanting to know uh, more or to be uh, more forward than is allowed, which Hugo von Trimberg assigns mainly uh, to uh, women, which is why we'll come back to that in the part on gender. In hand die Meide, weil er kannte und auch die Frauen über alle Land. Er schutte den Baum sahen zur Hand so rechte Wunderliche, dass die Birnen gelieche miteinander alle davon begonnen fallen. Ein Teil ihr in dir lachen kam, ihr Mann, die Herus nahm. Ein Teil fiel in den Brunnen, dir belieben ungewonnen. Ihr fiel ein Teil in den Dorn, mich dunket, die sie ihn auch verloren, wenn sie müssen fuhlen daran. Nicht wohl, man das erwenden kann. So he describes like in a um, Zeitraffer um, how um, this uh, tree changes um, and how all the pears fall down into different positions. And this uh, didactic device is taken from a parable which is told in all the three um, synoptic gospels. The parable of the sower, sower who sows seeds and some of them fall by the wayside, some fall on stony ground, some fall among thorns, some fall on good ground. So also the last point is the same with Hugo van Trimberg. Uh, the good ground is here the grass. Um, ihr fiel ein Teil, auch uf das Gras. Dir lagen wohl, svier fiel der was. Allein das Wetter in tät weh, doch verdorben jene andern, eh dir da lagen an böser Stadt, als man euch vor bescheiden hat. Nu merket, junge Lüte, was der Baum bedüte, der Dorn und auch das grüne Gras, und zwas mehr, uf der Heide was. So it takes also the same structure as in the parable and the gospels, uh, where first you tell a, a story full of images so that you can use it as a mnemonic device and then you have the didactic signal listen young people uh, what each of these elements uh, uh, means uh, bedüten is an interest in line 102 it's an interesting word because it comes from the same root as deutsch uh, so Bedüten means to tell something in German and in that act um, also means to explain, interpret something. So uh, the origin of the modern German word, uh, word bedeuten is to tell something in plain language, namely in the vernacular in, in German. So this pear tree structure then um, structures the whole uh, uh, poem uh, Der Renner because um, he systematically now goes through the different positions of the pairs. Uh, and he calculates on the one hand with a audience that is used to oral storytelling um, so to allow them to uh, go back uh, and use this image as a visual ad memoir. And on the other hand, he uh, calculates with uh, school children he's teaching in Bamberg, who will be familiar with this structure from uh, the Sunday school lessons of how to interpret different elements. All right, um, I'll uh, just um, skip that um, and I'll stop uh, the recording now.